Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Backpacking Light podcast. Today, we interviewed Dirk Friel, the founder of Training Peaks, and we're going to talk about endurance training and backpacking. Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way of pulling you to your peace of mind. Welcome to the Backpacking Life Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And in this episode, we're going to be talking to Dirk Friel. Dirk is one of the co-founders of Training Peaks, a powerful training tool that we've mentioned several times in the podcast before. Ryan, you had a nice long conversation with Dirk about endurance training, performance output, metrics, which fuels your body uses at what point, uh, the impact of high-intensity interval training on endurance and more. But before we get to that, let's spend some time catching up. So Ryan, what have you been thinking about lately? Um, I've been thinking about what life is going to be like post COVID. So Mm -hmm. um, I am, I'm one shot into my vaccination. I have my other one at the end of April on the 23rd. And so I've been looking specifically at, okay, now that we've been through this pandemic and we've seen so many people explore the outdoors for the very first time in response to it. What's it going to be like after that? Are they going to go back to doing their own thing and, and kind of exit the outdoors? I don't, I don't see that happening. I see, I see a prevailing trend here where a ton of new people have come to the outdoors and are going to stick with it, especially hiking. Now, most of this increase in hiking participation has been by day hikers, but as we know, Day hiking is kind of a gateway drug into Mm -hmm. backpacking. And so I've been looking at industry trends and um, statistics from national parks and and other agencies, and I found some really interesting stuff. So if you look at the comparison between 2019 and 2020, and we look at like the All Trails app, which is a a smartphone app, um, 163% increase in use of the app between May 2020 from May, 2019 Hmm. and increase in usage of the app. This is data reported by all trails. This is using the app as a navigation and research tool actually out in the, in the wild, when you're looking for trails and hiking on trails, the American hiking society reported that city trail usage in the U S has doubled from 2019 to 2020. And then if we take a snapshot at some national parks, I was originally looking at Rocky Mountain National Park because that's kind of my home area here. But um, Rocky closed down for a couple of months during mm-hmm. COVID and did not have the, the numbers that some of the other national parks have. But if we look at Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and then we look at the backcountry statistics that the Park Service collects, we saw a 47% jump in backcountry use in, in the Smokies from 2019 to 2020. And that's the, the summer fall period. And so that's in the Smokies, which are already a very busy park. So now those park campsites were virtually at capacity from June all the way to the end of December, which is kind of mind blowing to me. And so overall, if you look at the U S population growth in, in, 2007 to 2019, you know, we can project kind of how the population increases. And then we look at the participation in backpacking in those same years. Backpackers have grown eight times faster than the prevailing U.S. population. So from an industry standpoint, that bodes well for all of us. From a user standpoint, it it brings enormous challenges, new Mm -hmm. challenges Mm -hmm. in terms of how we're going to compete for permits and resources and how land management agencies are going to have to respond to this increase in demand for backcountry use. And then how do we fund that so we can take care of these lands? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, God, there's so much to unpack there. The, The Smoky Mountain data is interesting because a lot of people may know this, but so Smoky Mountain National Park is the most heavily trafficked national park in the country year after year. But the large majority of that usage is from cars, people just driving through, getting out, looking at an overlook, getting back in the car and driving on. So to hear that that backcountry experience has increased, it's really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, I took a major trip through the Smoky Mountain National Park backcountry permitting system in exactly the time you mentioned. 
And even with that increase, I had no problem getting permits for that yeah. park. Like I got all my first choices. Uh, it was pretty easy. So I, I do think there is sometimes the numbers don't reflect what the actual experience is. Right, right. Now, that being said, I'm also in the middle of, of struggling to get a permit for the Wonderland Trail right now. And um, I had a permit last year. I won their lottery system, had to cancel the trip because of the, the massive wildfires in the Pacific Northwest last year. And this year, um, I, I didn't get a permit in the lottery system. Now, uh, that national park has actually changed their permitting system from last year. Last year, it was just a wide open lottery. This year, they've divided it up into two sections. So there was an early access lottery that you could apply for. And if you don't get into that, then uh, on a certain day this month, they'll open it up to, you know, everyone can log on their computer at the same time and, and try to, to click and get permits for the, mm -hmm. the sites that they want. So um, that's, that seems to be uh, an interesting trend in the way that national parks are dealing with permitting. But I, th I think that there's also, it's, it's worth talking about uh, human impact on the places that we enjoy. Here in Rocky, you know, they have a permitting system in place and it has also changed during COVID. And so there used to be this tradition here where um, you would submit your name into the lottery. And then on this particular day in March or April, a ranger would like come out of the backcountry visitor center, put all the names into a hat and pull out your name. And people would actually <laughs> gather around there and, and, um, they call the name and, and if you were there, you know, you could file your mm -hmm. backcountry permit and it, it used to draw, you know, a couple hundred people obviously until COVID and then they suspended that. So now it's kind of a, it's a lottery system and they draw it in stages. So Chase and I both submitted um, applications for the lottery. We got drawn. He got drawn a couple of days before I did. And so he was able to get a permit for us in July or June. And, mm -hmm. and I picked up an October permit. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the trend is certainly going to lottery systems and permits. Um, I did get a permit in the Sierras this year in Inyo National Forest. It's very difficult it's a first come first serve kind of who's got the fastest click kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because within a minute of my entry day opening up 80% of everything was gone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really challenging now. Yeah. You know, um, right before we started recording this podcast, I was having a conversation with one of our authors and he was talking to me about the, uh, ethical implications of pointing out specific, locations, specific mm -hmm. lakes, specific, yeah. you know, and that, t that ties into geotagging with Instagram. Yeah. And, and so there's a whole kind of movement right now amongst, certainly amongst outdoor professionals. And I'm, and I'm seeing it filter down into people who just enjoy the outdoors of being pretty secretive about their locations. Yeah. It's kind of a backlash to the Instagram, uh, you know, uh, post a picture of a waterfall, geotag right. it, and then suddenly the next day there's a thousand people there. The it's a, this is really fascinating to me, and I've been studying this trend for a long time. As a as a backpacking guide, I used to want to create a guidebook for mm -hmm. my home area in Montana, but the the challenge with that is you get a lot of criticism from people saying, "Okay, you're disclosing really cool spots." um, and driving more people to it. Now I, in Montana, I don't think it's a huge issue because it, it's not a destination backpacking area in the way that the Sierra is or, mm -hmm. or Colorado is. But the, the practical implication of this is manifested in, for me personally, in the, in the Roper route in the high, Sierra high route. So I've done that a few times and watched through the years a trail evolve where no trail used to exist it's obviously an unmaintained route but now much of the high route that is at or just above the tree line through tundra is is there's a trail to follow now mm -hmm. and we're seeing some of these trails appear in places like the wind rivers several other places mm -hmm. in sierra there's a few places in colorado and so i I've, I've always been a little bit uneasy about publishing things online. That said, um, there's a big difference between publishing something on a website and publishing something on social media. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Geotagging on social media has completely transformed how people enjoy the outdoors. And it has completely transformed the experience that people have when they go to those unique landmarks. And there, there is a definite relationship. And just from talking to backcountry rangers and land management agencies all over the West, the, the prevailing conversation is focused on social media and its impact on crowds in the backcountry and, and what types of people they bring versus, you know, if someone goes to a blog to read about a backpacking trip and they see a route, they're going to, they might download that to their GPS and go do that route. But there's a difference between that and then seeing a really pretty place on social media and you wanting to go get your photo there because social media is your focus and not the backpacking. Experience. Right. Yeah. It's like the difference between, um, finding beta and, and, and just, um, wanting some kind of quick fix dopamine right. hit. Right, um, and I, I think yeah, I've never thought about that distinction before, but yeah, that's a really good line to draw. I like that yeah. a lot. So let's transition into another topic. You said you have finally organized your gear. Tell us what you're doing. <laughs> well, uh, so I moved, and I, that I took that opportunity to get finally get all of my gear out of like the giant bin I had it in. You know, kind of loosely organized by stuff sacks and things like that within the bin, but. Anytime I packed for a trip, I would have to explode all of that out, you know, all over the floor and um, it could take, you know, hours to pack for a trip. And so this move, I finally told my wife, look, I'm doing this professionally. It's time to have a gear closet. And so I went to Lowe's and dropped 200 bucks on organizers. And uh, now I have a beautiful color coded gear closet, you know, set up beautifully. And I was thinking about the ramifications of it. And I know that it's not feasible. You know, a lot of people don't have space in their house or their living area for this type of setup. But the ramifications for me are going to be more spur of the moment, mm -hmm. one night overnighters that I can pack for in 20 minutes, get out the door, come back the next morning. And I'm really looking forward to having that kind of experience as opposed to trips that they take me weeks and weeks to plan for, and then I'm gone for you know multiple weeks. Now that uh, Chase has gone off to college, we have a really strong desire to downsize and live in a much smaller space, and so we're thinking through this as well. And I, I, I think I'm going to be transitioning into short spur of the moment trips too. And and one of my favorite things to do is to take a small pack, pre-pack it with everything you know, freeze dried food and everything ready to go, and just hang it on a door hook next to the mm. door. So mm -hmm. that I, I don't have to do anything. So my, I've never done exactly that before. I've always tweaked gear and grabbed right. some extra supplies and things like that. But I'm, I'm going to try it once we, once we try this. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is a really intriguing concept to me is, is how, do you, how do you live in a multi-sport hobby culture with very few things and very small spaces? So that to me is way more intriguing than looking at somebody's gear shed and seeing how they they organize a storage unit with all their backpacking gear, you know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, you know, and I fight against the, I try to be a minimalist in my daily life. I try to always downsize stuff. You know, I've got three ties and if someone gives me another tie, I get rid of one tie, you know, that's just an example. <laughs> but, um, with, with the gear with this job is getting out of control for me because part of what I do involves receiving gear and testing yeah. it. And, um, and I find selling stuff online to be a gigantic pain in the butt. It is. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm struggling with that. But, yeah. um, so well, speaking of gear, you've been testing an interesting jacket lately. Do you want to fill us in on that? Yeah. So Enlightened Equipment came out with the Torrid Apex jacket, what, a couple of years ago. And this is a Climashield Apex insulated um, 7 to 10 denier fabric shell and lining hood. Um, a very, a very good warmth to weight ratio on this jacket. And we reviewed it. We did an exhaustive review on it, took a look at its insulation ability and everything. And now they're coming out with the Torrid Apex pullover soon. So maybe next week, maybe two weeks, we'll, we'll see sometime in April. Mm -hmm. And the pullover design has always been 
my preference for an insulated jacket because this is not something I wear all the time. So unlike a wind shirt, and I've worn pullovers and full zip wind shirts, and I far prefer a full zip wind shirt because this is my active layer. I want right. the ventilation. I'm taking it on and off more frequently. I'm not doing that with an insulated layer, so I can accept the limitations of a pullover. But what I really like about a pullover is the partial zip allows you to put a, a pass through quarterback pocket in, right? I have a, a kangaroo style hand warmer pocket. And that I love because on a cold day, there's just nothing quite as cozy as putting your hands together in that pocket and, and allowing them to share the body heat. So I'm really excited about the jacket. Mine is a size medium. It weighs 7.7 .7 ounces. I've worn it all through the Wyoming winter. Um, I've worn it in some surprisingly cold conditions. It's retained its loft. Well, climate shield apex is probably the most durable of the synthetic insulations mm -hmm. I've used. I baby it. I don't overstuff it. And, and I think this is going to be a winner. I have a couple of questions about this. Um, one, we should point out the, the last point that you made is very important and we'll put a link to the synthetic insulation podcast that we did and some other links, but take care of your synthetic insulation. It's yeah. the short version. Um, but I, I'm remembering the review that we wrote on the zip version. And I think the one criticism or critique that we had is that it's a, it wasn't a very sophisticated fit. Hopefully I'm remembering that, that correctly. It seemed a little boxy or a little baggy, I think to our reviewers, how does this version stack up in that regard? I, I think it's a boxy fit as well. So you're not going to get the kind of. Oh, fit that you will get the, uh, the athletic fit you're going to get out of a Patagonia or an Arcteryx jacket. However, I think that makes it warmer. Mm -hmm. I think if you put some airspace in between your synthetic layers or your synthetic insulation layer and what you're wearing underneath it, it makes for a more comfortable and warmer fit. It's not going to be Instagram sexy, but mm -hmm. it's not bad. I mean, it's, it's a fine jacket and, and this allows it to loft more fully. And I, I prefer that. I prefer the performance to, to weight ratio to be optimized rather than the fit optimized. Yeah, that sure. said, it's, it's fairly, it's long enough to cover my waist when I'm reaching overhead and the sleeves are nice and long, so they don't ride up. And the mm. hood is, the hood is large enough to layer over, uh, big heads and, and hats and things like that. And, and all these things are, are tuned to optimizing warmth. Plus, because it's enlightened equipment, you can get it in all kinds of color combinations. If, if yes. you did want a little bit of pop yes. on your Instagram That's page. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, well, I've been looking at a new pack that was just released this spring. Um, it's by Nunatech Gear, and it's called the Bears Ears 50. We don't have our hands on one of these packs yet, but um, I think it's worth taking a look at, especially if you're on the West Coast in, in the areas where you need a bear canister, because... The whole idea behind this pack is bear canister compatibility. So if you've ever tried to shove a bear canister down inside a pack to get it down to your center of gravity, or if you've had to lash it on top of a pack and then you wobble back and forth on, on um, weird terrain, you know this is a big deal because this pack is designed with a curved bottom that the bear canister can just kind of slide right up into on the outside and then strap in. And it just looks like a super it's, – it's, it looks like one of those things that you're like, I can't believe no one's ever thought of this before. Um, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's definitely worth taking a look at. I also like the way that this pack handles um, hydration. It's got these like vertical water bottle holders that sort of slide in uh, vertically. It's sort of like a utility belt style as opposed to having to slide them into a, uh, uh, a pocket on the side of the pack or even horizontally on the sides. Interesting. Yeah. Bear canisters are becoming required at more and more locations throughout the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California. And obviously the national parks in the West are gravitating to them, uh, Yellowstone and Rocky and, and everything else. And most of the most of the backpackers I see on the trail there, they've lashed the canister to the top of their pack. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've done that as well. And it's it's a little bit unwieldy. It's heavy, makes your pack a little bit top heavy. But packing them down inside vertically is a nightmare. Yeah. sideways requires a large pack mm -hmm. and i always thought you know where this should go is 
you know, where you'd put a sleep external sleeping bag on an external frame pack, you know, down exactly. at the bottom lashed. Mm -hmm. And that's what the bears ears is doing. And so it's, it's not, it's an unconventional design. It's, it's something that all, people are going to have a hard time overcoming the aesthetics of it. But I think once you put the pack on and actually carry this thing, and this is where you're putting your food can, I think it's going to be um, a positive development in backpack design. Yeah, you know, I actually really like the aesthetics of it. Uh, it caught my eye immediately, but maybe that's just because I, I've just come off a couple of trips struggling with my bear canister. So Yeah, right. So the other thing I've been looking at is how to measure compression on an insulating garment or sleeping bag. And this is related to bear canisters because bear, the bear canister is my measurement tool. And so what I've been doing, I've been looking at trying to compare the compressibility of like a synthetic garment, like the Torrid Apex pullover to a, a similar weight down garment and a similar weight fleece garment. So that's, that's, those are my three test cases. So I've been taking a bear canister, stuffing a garment in there, um, and measuring its uncompressed volume, mainly by squishing it down and then just letting it loft back up naturally. And that's what I call the uncompressed volume. So it's the volume where there's no pressure sitting on top of the jacket. And then I'll measure a compressed volume by, I built a disc that fits, it's the diameter of the bear canister. It's a circular disc that, that covers the entire cross section. Put that in the bear canister on top of the garment. The disc is light, it's cardboard. And then I'll take a, a weight plate from my barbell set and I'll put that weight plate on top of the disc so it provides an even pressure down. And then same kind of thing. I've, I've measured it with just gently setting the disc on the, on the cardboard and letting it compress. And then I've squished it down and seeing how the jacket bounces back up and mm -hmm. then measuring both of those compressed volumes and then changing the weights. And so what you end up is with a couple of compression curves that give you um, some really interesting insight between synthetic insulated garments, down insulated garments, and what we think of as bulky fleece garments. Mm -hmm. And so what I've found is that they're all similar at light, light compression, right? Which is how most of us take care of our gear. We don't overstuff it tremendously. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of like the lightweight backpacking philosophy is you don't have to cram everything into this, into this tiny volume in order to fit all your gear. But what happens with the heaviest weights when it, you do need that compression, that's where you start to see these significant differences where down obviously is the winner synthetic and then fleece being the bulkiest. But I was really surprised because this narrative is something we've communicated and heard so many times is fleece is bulky down is most compressible. But the reality is at the pressures we're stuffing most of our stuff, there's not a huge difference. Mm. That actually makes sense when you when you think about it in practicality because I've gotten all types, all three of those different types of insulation into roughly the same stuff sack mm -hmm. over the years, you know? So it makes right. sense when you actually yeah. uh, apply that to your real life. Anyway, my conclusion is compressibility may not be a huge factor in your decision to buy a particular garment over the other at, in most situations. Now, if, you're, if your pack space is at a premium, then maybe it is. Right. And of course, there's other considerations too with the type sure. of insulation you choose. Yep. All right. Well, let's move into our interview. Ryan, do you want to introduce our guest? He's a pretty cool speaker today. Yeah. Dirk Friel is the founder of Training Peaks. Training Peaks is a subscription-based software that takes data from your fitness watch and other devices, imports them into um, its platform, and then analyzes the data and gives you a measure of how much stress you put on your body during a workout. And then that data can be used to monitor acute short-term fitness, which is uh, important so that you can modulate your your training regimen and and make sure that you're recovering sufficiently. It monitors your long term fitness so that you're you're ramping up to the point where you can achieve the goals you want to achieve, and it monitors your fatigue. So these three measurements allow you to make decisions about 
how hard you should train the next day and how, what kind of training volume you need between now and your event or race or next backpacking trip. And so Dirk and I go through a variety of different um, scenarios for backpackers specifically, and we talk through a whole host of subjects. So it's a, it's, it was a great conversation, and I'm looking forward to um, you listening to Dirk and I have this chat. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dirk Friel from earlier this week. Hi, Dirk, and welcome to the Backpacking Light podcast today. Hey, awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Good. Uh, thanks for having me on. You bet. Today's discussion is going to focus on endurance training and backpacking. And I want to lead off by introducing our readers to kind of the important foundational question here, and that is, what is endurance training and why should backpackers care about it? Oh, boy. Well, um, it's a necessity if we want to travel, I guess, at a decent pace and, and continually improve that pace, hopefully, as, as athletes, we want to get better. We have hope that the work we put in will actually make gains. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of physiological changes that happen when you train um, that are very positive. You can take it too far and it can be detrimental. Um, but if you do it right and moderate and, and consistency is a big part of endurance training and that can, you know, make you go faster and be safer as you travel through, through the mountains. One of the most common refrains I hear from our audience is that, you know, they're, they're, they're going on their annual vacation to Rocky mountain national park and they're spending a week there and they, they get hit by altitude and lack of fitness. And they're just fatigued when it comes time to do one of these 2000 foot climbs up and over into a lake basin. So to me, that's like the ideal scenario for endurance training. And, and to what extent do you think endurance training can help normal backpackers accomplish those types of goals in the backcountry? Well, obviously if you show up with a whole lot of red blood cells and a lot of, uh, you know, muscle mitochondria, that's well, um, I guess, designed for endurance is going to help you enjoy that experience more. So building up that endurance, building up that capability, that aerobic base, aerobic fitness is going to help you adapt as you get to a higher altitude. Certainly though, it's going to have some effect on you going to a higher altitude. Roughly speaking, you're going to lose about 1% for every thousand feet you go up in altitude. Um, so you go from sea level to 10,000 feet in Rocky Mountain National Park, 10% drop, but it could be more than that. You know, each individual is unique and different. If you show up tired and overtrained, it's going to be more than 10% drop in, in, um, performance output. So showing up fresh is certainly a part of it. Um, and you know, it, you you might feel actually good and fine on day one, but it's more about probably day two and three where, where it'll really start to set in. So be careful not to push it too hard, you know, days two, three, four. Ideally, if you are there for eight days or so, you can kind of ramp up over your vacation and just don't do the big climbs right at the beginning. Okay, so you mentioned that you drop a percentage point of performance output for every thousand feet you gain. What are you using to measure or or be your metric for perform performance output here? Uh, you know, when I think performance output, I, I think pace. You know, I have a cycling background, so I naturally tend to think wattage. So power at almost any intensity level will, will drop, you know, around that percentage. Um, so, yeah, basically pace is what I'm thinking about probably the curve is different at each intensity level. Right. Um, so the higher the intensity, probably the more effect it would have. Um, but again, 1% per every thousand is kind of just general guideline. It's, sure. you know, everybody's unique. It's probably more dramatic, you know, once you get to 4,500, that's where it really starts to take effect per se. Uh, generally speaking below 3000 feet, you don't really have to account for it. Um, but if you are at sea level going to 10,000, 
yeah, you could easily see eight, eleven percent uh, drop. Yeah, I know that in in high altitude medicine, they often note that there's a threshold of around 8,000 feet, where if you're coming from sea level to 8,000, you start to experience, or the, the probability that you're gonna start to experience high altitude sickness symptoms, you know, 8,000 feet is that marker. Is there anything special about 8,000 feet versus 4,500 feet? Or is it a fairly linear relationship as you go up in altitude? I'm not the expert on this. Um, I just think it's, it's probably just an accumulative and again like that curve the shape of that curve of of how it affects you probably starts to just ramp up more as you get above 8000 i suspect yeah. um certainly not the expert on that topic but you know i i live at 5500 um i spend many nights at 10000 feet up in breckenridge um colorado which is right below 10000 feet i definitely feel it when i go up there first few days. Um, but then I tend to kind of adapt to it, you know, after about four days, I don't really even think about it. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's coming from living at 5,500 feet. Right. When you're, when you're now you're a ski mountaineering racer and when you're training for an event, that's at an altitude and you're, you know, I'm sure one of your strategies is let's, let's go to that area a day or two before to acclimate. Do you tend to sleep low before the event and and maybe uh, before the event hike up higher to get some acclimation or are you do you encourage actually sleeping as high as possible? And this is this question's targeted the answer to this, this question would be targeted to our community who is coming into a place like Red Lodge Montana where we have our guided trekking program. You know, and do we want them to spend the night in Red Lodge and then hike up to eight or nine thousand feet for the days prior, or or do we want them to sleep higher? Oh gosh, I guess if you just stand back from that question, and ideally, how would you train? You'd sleep high, train low. Yeah. And 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 why? Because you get that adaptive um, blood, you know, chemistry change, the EPO kicking in, the natural EPO. Um, building up the red blood cells by sleeping high. But then as you train high, you can't get the same intensity level. So ideally you then train at sea level so you can right. push because there's a, because there's an aerobic ceiling, it therefore prevents your muscles from being pushed to their maximum. So if you are at 10,000 feet, you just can't push your muscles really to the true max. Whereas if you were to sleep at 10,000 and train at sea level, you could then maximize all systems and as well as have that benefit. Um, so didn't directly answer your question there. Um, no, that's if you good, want to repeat I, that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, there's always this question of, do we want to sleep as high as possible to allow our body to adapt or do we want to train as high as possible before we do our event so that we can be training in a like environment? Yeah, and I think it, it's gravitated towards sleep. Um, mm -hmm. If you can somehow cycle that sleep and kind of go up in stages, you know, like, you know, you're, you are have you have more of a mountaineering background than I do, but, it, you know, if you're going to Nepal and Himalayas, you, you tend to have this strategy of maybe go up to another camp, come back down, right. you know, and, and kind of keep progressing up. Some athletes have tried, you know, the altitude chamber tents, before they go to altitude and they're at sea level sleeping in the tent, but it's not the same. The, you know, the pressure is not, um, there. Um, so, so yeah, it's that, that cycle of trying to kind of push the limits and come back down, let the body recover a bit, push the limits, come back down. Right. Might be the ideal situation if you're going to high altitude, um, adventure. Yeah. Good. We uh, let's shift shift gears for a minute. I want to talk through some basic principles of endurance training because we have communicated some of this on our podcast previously. And specifically, there's three metrics that that endurance athletes tend to look at. One is the aerobic threshold. One is the anaerobic threshold or or lactate threshold. And then the third is the VO2 max. Can you talk us through what each of those means and how important each of those things are to a backpacker looking to do a long distance trip? 
Yeah, for sure. I think the most important one would be aerobic threshold. That is where you are trying to maximize your pace kind of at a quote lower intensity level, but you're not tapping into massive amounts of blood glucose. You know, you can oxidize fat very efficiently. That's another key component around aerobic threshold. You're utilizing a, a fuel source that is almost just unlimited, you know, fat reserves. So if you can get very, very efficient at your aerobic threshold, and if you think about the talk test, you know, you can still talk. Um, you don't have to like concentrate too hard to walk with somebody and, and talk, but it's not just, you know, walking in the mall, but you're, you might be on an incline, you're kind of moving briskly through a trail. Um, it takes a little bit of effort to talk to somebody, but no, you know, no real problem at all. But when you get to that stage of it's now tough to talk, that's more about, you know, zone three, we might call it in the cycling world. The, the anaerobic threshold is where it's very, very difficult to, you could not maintain a sentence. Um, you do not want to talk to anybody. This is where you've now switched fuel sources. Um, you know, you're always kind of burning fat and sugar, but it's, it's the relative percentage of, of that shift as you go through these stages, as you get to anaerobic, uh, threshold, it all, it's pretty much all almost, um, glycogen reserves that you're, that you're tapping into your muscle glycogen, your liver glycogen. Um, you can go through that, you know, rapidly. If you're going all out 100% for 90 minutes, you're going to tap out, uh, you know, a lot of that reserve. Um, so for backpacking, um, travel, it's really about pushing the aerobic threshold. Another aspect of a aerobic threshold is the, the component of lactate and lactate has really gotten a bad rap over the decades, but lactate is actually a fuel source as well. So we can train our bodies to become more efficient at recycling that lactate. You are always creating lactate in your muscles. Even just sitting here, we're, we're creating lactate, but we can, the muscle can actually recycle that as a fuel source. Um, but at a certain point you, that's going to build up and that's going to be your anaerobic threshold. Um, it really isn't the lactate that is the bad thing. It's the hydrogen ions that are built up, you know, from that lactate that really, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of take over, um, the chemical processes and that's where you have to back off. Um, so we can increase both aerobic and anaerobic. It's more important really for backpackers to increase their aerobic threshold, recycle lactate, get very good at you know, fat utilization. Um, then you mentioned VO2 max, and that's your absolute all out. If you think about it as a pace, it's the pace you can maintain all out 100% for six minutes. Okay. You know, and that is not a part of really this sport. You are not going all out 100% for three minutes or six minutes. Um, that's absolutely a part of the sport in cycling and the tour de France. Um, that's something that's, you know, a very, very key component in those sports. Um, you can have, two, let's suppose we have two different you, yourself and, and, and myself. If we had the same VO two max, we still might be very, very different athletes when it came to backpacking right. and performing at 10,000 feet and going up Long's Peak, for example. You know, you may have trained that ability to utilize fat, to recycle lactate, and you have a your aerobic threshold might be a much higher percentage of your VO2 max as compared to me, even though we have the same VO2 maxes. Um, so that's where I'm saying in backpacking, it's very important to build up that capability, that aerobic threshold. That's hours and hours on end. You know, it, it is, it, it should be an uncomfortable kind of pace that you're pushing and you're not stopping every 30 minutes, right. you know, and having a, a coffee break, you know, you're really, you're really trying really to sustain want, that. Right. You want to build up that amount of time in what we might call a zone two, you know, a lot of cyclist triathletes will have a five, five or six zone methodology and zone four is just below anaerobic threshold. 
Um, zone two is really that aerobic threshold zone that we target. So building up more and more time in that zone two and it's steady, constant um, uh, pace. And it's not a lot of recovery um, within th those sessions. Um, they become harder. And you can start to look at a term that we call decoupling. So you have pace, you, you have heart rate and pace. And ideally they just stay parallel. Right. But at a certain point, as you build up that metabolic stress, either your pace is gonna drop or your heart rate's gonna climb, you know, one or the other. And so we can track that, you know, with GPS monitors, um, sometimes just a stopwatch. <laughs> um, so you can see, are you traveling faster? Ideally, we want you to train faster at the same heart rate. You know, right. that is really the goal. You know, if your zone two, top of zone two is like mine, and it's 146 or so, you know, I want to travel faster at that 145 heart rate right. um, as I progress through training. So are you suggesting that at the point at which you begin to decouple, that that hmm. means you've you've started the good stuff or you need to end your training session? You can go a little bit past that point, but I think it's good to kind of not there's diminishing returns when yeah. you get, when you're talking this type of training, most people go too hard. Yeah. And may, um, that makes uh, recovery more difficult. Yeah. And you start to tap into a totally different metabolic pathway, which we're not trying to train. We're trying to stay right. in that, that fat utilization, fat oxidative state. Um, and if you go too hard, and you, you do a really hard three minute effort up, up and over that hill, you're now almost 100% burning, you know, glucose. And now to get back into that fat oxidative state and build, you know, tapping in the fat reserves, it, it might take 20 minutes till you get back yeah. to that point. Right. Um, so we really want to like, just stay right. And, and again, with lactate as well, we want that nice kind of cycle of, of lactate, you know, being produced and recycled, being produced and recycled, and just sit there in a constant pace and, and build up that uh, capability. And for, again, like my background is more, you know, cycling Tour de France, then they're doing these workouts for four or five hours straight, just sitting there at a uncomfortable pace, which is well beyond what I could even do for 45 minutes. But you know, these are trained professionals, but they're, they're doing long training sessions at, at that pace. Yeah, that's unbelievable. So that that's a good segue into the next topic, which is um, it's it's a twofold kind of thing where most of us, this is a a side hobby and we have day jobs and not hmm. tons of time. So being able to uh, train for four to five hours a day is unrealistic for most of us. But the, the second thing is this kind of marketing driven gym fad where everyone's trying to hijack i'm going to put fitness in quotes here um, using high intensity in interval training orange theory comes to mind um, using um, these these social uh, clubs like crossfit that are really based on short spurts of intensity and things like that so talk to me about those kinds of programs and how they impact endurance training if in a positive or negative way yeah when when, when you describe that i'm thinking about you know i mentioned the metabolic, metabolic pathways the fuel sources and that's where scientists would jump to so you're doing really intense 45 minute orange theory crossfit whatever it might be all out all in you know intensity the whole time that's 100 percent sugar you know you're you're just burning uh, that donut or whatever you had, you know, prior to arrival, um, you are not training that, uh, that fat oxidative metabolic pathway or the, you know, recycling the, um, the lactate. And so what ends up happening is you, you end it, you feel great, you, you burn through a bunch of calories, um, but now you're depleted and yeah. now you go eat a high carb um lunch you're gonna have the gatorade the coke whatever it might be um and and you you could end up just gaining more weight that's what a, a lot of people actually end up yeah. doing is they train so intense that they then just eat more sugar and it's just this kind of vicious cycle and they're just packing it on 
And when you have excess sugar, it just turns to fat. Um, so that is certainly not the way. There are other ways I'd love to discuss that you can somewhat kind of hack, you know, the fitness. Um, but I would not jump to Orange Theory for uh, the big backcountry uh, adventure. Yeah, when um, I, I trained under Scott Johnston for a while, he was the co-author of I did too. Training, training for a New Alpinism, right on. And yep. um, one of the things Scott told me, I, w I, was, I went into my training period a little bit overweight, and I, I've suffered from back injuries uh, throughout my life. And, and I said, Scott, I really need to get this weight off. And he was adamant about saying, don't worry about it. It'll come off. And it was slow, but you know, several months into my base period building, I had dropped 20 pounds pretty readily and was <laughs> starving and I could eat anything I want. So it was, it was fascinating to me to see that a, an endurance regimen, and it wasn't terribly intense, six to eight hours a week. Um, created a, an opportunity for me to a stabilize my weight and and switch from um, a an unhealthy metabolism to a fat uh, dominant metabolism. So that was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he preaches a lot about this zone two mm -hmm. um, aerobic threshold, and m most people go too fast. Yeah, uh, and sometimes. Sometimes people think, well, I need a jog to go, you know, get that kind of intensity. And then when you look at the numbers, it's like, no, you need to start walking yeah. that hill because you are going way too hard. Right. And it's that, again, it's that, it's that percentage, you know, of VO2 max at which you can perform at a, you know, a long sustained period of time. Um, I forget, they call it the, not metabolic syndrome, but some syndrome they, they call it. <laughs> Yeah, I think metabolic syndrome does encapsulate some of that. It does, um, but they, they have some other term for that's more exercise related. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but it's it's definitely in their books. Great, great book. Um, they have two. Um, Training for the uphill athlete is yes. their more recent one. And yeah, and we'll, all your altitude questions, a lot of those are are in the original book. Yeah, we'll uh, put links to both those books yeah. in our show notes too. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about what a backpacker needs specifically. And when I'm thinking of backpacking, I think of four really key activities. One is hill climbing. So carrying a heavy pack up, a mount, up and over a mountain pass. So what, that's a little bit different than, than training for a marathon that might be flatter, right? So what can we do to adapt our endurance training to um, specifically target hill climbing? I would probably not do more than two days a week, but start at one. Um, and I would, I actually, you know, did some of this myself, but I would have a pack with water bottles, fill the water bottles, you know, like three water bottles full, a couple, uh, I don't know, six gallons or so of water, you know, weighs quite a bunch. Um, and I would start out at, you know, 15 minute efforts, trying to keep a ceiling on my heart rate, you know, mm -hmm. again, trying it, it, during these, you're you're going to creep up above zone two into yeah. into zone three, but you don't want to get into that anaerobic kind of zone four area. But once or twice a week, you know, working in that that fifteen minute type effort. The beauty of the water bottles, you dump them out at the top, yeah. and you go downhill with less stress on the joints. Especially yeah. for me, you know, that was a big big deal for me. Um, but then I I got to where I was doing, um, you know, an hour effort up, you know. Uh, 2,500 vert climb here locally, mm -hmm. you know, I could do the water bottle carry up, drop the water. And then, um, a couple times I actually could go a lap and a half, you know, and I got t to that level. So, um, it's, it's that progression and that's muscular endurance that really right. you're talking there. This is where the gym work can help as well. Just because we said, don't jump in a CrossFit five days a week, um, there's still a place for, for the gym and yeah. building pure force. We're not tracking heart rate, you know, in the gym, but this is just pure force. Um, another thing I would do around this was just indoor strength sessions, but it was muscular endurance based step ups and squit, mm -hmm. um, split squat jumps with a yeah. pack on, uh, I think it started at 10% body weight is where we started. 
but we did hundreds and hundreds. We would do, I, I think it got up to where it took me like 75 minutes to get through a workout and between just those two exercises. So we would, something like 800, um, you know, reps per exercise, but they were in 10 to 15 rep right. segments and like 10 second recoveries. Um, so not a lot of recovery, um, with the weight pack and that really helped. I mean, the problem with it is you felt horrible. It probably takes three or four <laughs> weeks to, right. to really adapt to where you can recover from it. And that's once a week, yeah. you know, and you felt horrible after that. You just have to suffer through that. But then once you get to that week four and you can start to recover from it, then I, I play, uh, I added a second day of muscular endurance indoors with the pack. Mm -hmm. Um, and that really, really, I noticed helped on my descending, my running downhill, yeah. my skiing downhill. Um, I could take more impact. Um, you know, the musc muscles could withstand more and do right. more. Yeah. So it helped not only for the uphill, you know, lugging the pack, but the downhill drudgery, you know, and that's the hardest part for me is <laughs> carrying the pack downhill. Uh, but yeah, those indoor muscular endurance workouts were, were fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed them as well. And I, I also found that as I progressed and got stronger, um, the, the level of output you could do and still stay within zone two and dancing into mm. zone three really improved. And that, that was always really fascinating to me. And, and the improvement happens pretty fast. Yeah. And it, you know, this is the key part of endurance training is, is that, um, consistency. It is not going to feel good for the first month. Right. right but that right. consistency of getting after it, but yet you have to have the right amount. You have to listen to your body. You know, if, if, if you're not ready for it, don't jump into it, but you know, it might, you might need another recovery day, but you know, try it again tomorrow, that yeah. consistency of training. And this is the modulation of training as well. We've now covered off on several different types of training days. Um, so the modulation of the training as well is where you start to get to this periodization concept, yeah. right? And every day is not the same. If you do every single day, the same for the next six months, you will plateau, you know, five, six weeks from now, and you won't improve. <laughs> and the idea so, with modulation, just for our listeners, is you're giving your body a little bit of time to recover after difficult days, right? Yeah, and stressing a different system, yeah. if you will. You know, we just talked about muscular endurance. We talked about aerobic threshold. Um, there's a place for anaerobic threshold as well to try and push that up. Yeah. Um, but that's like modulation of training methods okay. along with recovery days. Um, right. and then that consistency of that, that rhythm. Um, but then continually it, each one of those, um, systems might, might improve at different, um, you know, um, rates. So you sort of have to s track that and how you're improving in, in each, um, area of the training. Right. right. The second topic I want to discuss so hill climbing was first. The second one is long duration days. So imagine the scenario where a backpacker wakes up at dawn and wants to hike through the mountains until dusk. And so maybe it's 20 or 30 miles over uh, difficult terrain. The, the barrier to most of the people I've worked with are, you know, they get to four or five o'clock in the afternoon and their, their muscles are done. They just can't take them up a hill anymore. So even though they've stayed within their aerobic threshold the whole day, what can we do to extend the number of hours per day that we're actually being able to perform? And are they breaking down muscularly? Is that yeah. what you're kind of, yeah. yeah. And I would go back to that muscular endurance type concept and, and work in the gym or the uphill efforts that will certainly help with the ability to kind of maintain a pace or that endure, uh, especially on the downhills. Another key component is well a couple um one pace the first couple hours mm -hmm. you, you feel incredibly you feel great right that's where you need to hold back hold back yeah, if right. you go out <laughs> you go out too hard to, and that's the same with me and my you know schemo ski mountaineering racing you know my last race took seven hours and it's all about the first hour if i can get if I can just do the right pace the first hour it's going to immensely help in the sixth and you know seventh right. hour but I've had days where I go out 
way too hard the first hour and I lose all kinds of time on the back end. So if you can maintain um, the proper pace, stay within yourself the first couple hours, I, maybe have a friend with you that you know is slower than you, you know, that helps a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and then third is nutrition. You know, are you training the gut? Um, this is a large part of even what I'm trying to train myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my racing, I'm trying to do, so if I'm doing a seven hour race, I'm trying to target around 90 grams an hour of carbohydrate. Um, that can be tough to do, you know, what forms do you take that in as, um, if I can do, you know, 90 grams an hour, 90, hundred grams an hour. I, I know it's going to help me a lot on, on the second part of my, you know, long efforts in the, in the mountains. So I don't want to go out too hard and I want to stay on top of my nutrition. That's really, yeah. and, the, and then the, the whole muscular endurance strength work, that's, that's already been done. That's at home. Yeah. That's the weeks leading up to it. Um, and then it's just that progression. You know, I don't think you start with, you know, a 12 hour day, um, right. it needs to progress up to that 12 hour mark. So pro progression, you know, over time is, is another key component. Yeah. That's really good advice, especially for through hikers who are, you know, out on the trail for weeks or months at a time. And that's the next scenario that I want to talk about is, uh, in the context of a long duration trip where you are, you're putting in eight, 10, 12 hours a day, day after day after day for, you know, three weeks on a trail like the Colorado trail or three months on a trail like the Appalachian trail, how do you, how do you train so that your body's resilient enough to be able to put an effort like this in every single day? Well, you can't replicate that in training. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, you know, some thoughts again, from a cycling background, some ways Tour de France guys kind of are starting to hack their way a bit. You know, there are, there are teams that have discovered they they can drop their total volume by upwards of 20, 25% um, by introducing heat training and heat, heat adaptation. Um, and I'll go into that, but they've had amazing results. Um, and so what they've done is uh, by riding on an indoor bike, you can, obviously it, it can be warmer, you, if you don't use a fan, if you have long sleeve jersey, long you know long sleeve leg warmers, no air movement, um, you can increase that heat. They can track the core body temp, and then by doing heat training, you can increase your blood plasma volume, um, which allows you to go faster you know in the races. Um, and and so that's one thing they've done is is heat training, and so concepts might be, you know, do heat training, uh, indoor on a treadmill. Um, you only have, let's say you're working and you can only do one and a half, two hours in the morning, one and a half, two hours in the evening. You might introduce one of those sessions, um, where it's, it, it, it's hot, you know, yeah. and the other one might be cool and maybe you progress where they're both hot. Um, obviously be careful, you know, you could get in trouble, just word of warning. Um, but we've seen great, great gains from heat adaptation. Um, and, and that's with double sessions. These, these cyclists are doing double days. Um, one of them being heat manipulation. The other one could what be kind a of, low... What kind of temperatures are they doing this in? Well, they're tracking their core body temp. Okay. And All so right. that's like, is it 38.5? I'm trying to think of Celsius, but Celsius. Yeah. Um, there's a new device called core, which you might review, but uh, it's called the core body temp. Um, it actually is just a little clip that you put on your heart rate strap and it measures um, core body temp. And they've got some studies, they've got some testing protocols, um, training protocols. So this is uh, definitely a, 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 something that's really taking effect in, uh, in the world of pro cycling. Another thing can be, you know, carb manipulation. So carbohydrate intake, and I stay away from the word fasted, right? Completely fasted workouts certainly can have benefit, but I think at a certain point, if you do too many of them, the metabolic stress in the body just yeah. is not, is not worth it, but you can do double days 
again, experience from cycling, whereby these cyclists are doing intense, their intensity, the first workout of the day, after a normal breakfast, they would have a sports drink, you know, in their bottle, doing 75 or more grams an hour in this morning session of an hour and a half or two hours. Um, but their lunch would be fat and protein based, very little carbs at lunch. Um, and then they would go out for their um, endurance ride in the afternoon, endurance, endurance intensity. And they're doing only two or three hours in the afternoon. So they're getting in, you know, four or five hours for the day in two different sessions, but they're manipulating the carbs in the middle. So therefore they're, they're pushing their body into this more fuel, um, fat as a fuel, um, state for the second ride of the day, instead of doing six hours a day, they, they might only do four hours, but they're getting more benefit out of it than if they did six straight hours. Okay. Um, and they're also able to maintain this and they're doing this 10 days in a row. You know, this is not a, a twice a week type thing. Right. So if you were to do a six hour fasted ride 10 days in a row, um, that would have a lot of stress on the body. Recovery would start to be, um, compromised. So they found this is a nice balance where they can recover well, they, but yet they can push their body into that, um, fat. Uh, oxidative state and build that aerobic capability um, without doing all kinds of hours. So, so for hiking, you, you know, you could do the same thing. Maybe, you know, I think an in, indoor treadmill might be a kind of secret weapon in a way where you can get that, those early morning hours, um, do the, uh, do some heat um, focus training, build that blood volume. And then after work, go for, you know, another few hours um, and, you know, you, you might be able to hack some of your way there. Yeah. Interesting. Fascinating stuff. Um, the, the world of cycling seems to be at the forefront of all this. Why well, sauna, it kind of started in a way with around saunas too. You know, yeah. they would finish their, well, it, it was both ends. It was like, okay, we're going to fast and do, you know, four or five hour ride fasted, no breakfast. And then afterwards, uh, let's jump in the sauna. And, you, you know, they definitely saw benefits from just, mm -hmm. you know, from that. But then it's like how, how can you maintain that? That becomes very difficult. So right. there's, so now they start to tweak things and find, you know, these secrets and what works. And it's a fascinating story about a cyclist that won a very famous race called Perry Roubaix. He broke his arm or hand. I can't remember which one, a wrist, um, six weeks out from the race, but yet mentally he wanted to continue. And so yeah. they, they trained 100% indoors and he won the race. And this is a seven and a half hour, one of the hardest races in the world. And he did 100% of his training indoors. And he only did 20 hours a week, whereas normally it'd be 28, 30 yeah. hours a week. Um, but they really kind of brought it down to the efficiency of training indoors. There was no coasting. Um, now hiking, you're not going to coast even right. if you're outdoors. Um, but, um, the heat element of training indoors really increases blood plasma volume and, you know, had great effect. And, and that was in 2016, that was kind of a watershed moment in, in training for cycling. And then that caught the eye of a bunch, you know, of this particular coach who worked on that, um, methodology and started to build it up and gained the trust of the riders. And now you, you would never go to a Tour de France training camp in the past and train indoors. You know, that right. never happened. Now they actually have daily indoor sessions. Yeah, wow. And they're working okay. on that heat. That heat element has been proven in science that it can make you faster. It can improve your blood plasma volume by becoming adapted to heat. Now, even though, and it works if you're going to a cold climate. If you're going to go to Rocky Mountain National Park and do, you know, it's never crazy hot there. <laughs> Um, this will still help you at, you know, 12,000 feet on a cold yeah. day. Yeah. Fascinating. So the fourth scenario I want to look at is these guys who are doing multi-day FKTs, fastest known time attempts of long trails. I think of, mm -hmm. as an example, Jeff Garmeyer, who is a member of our community, has been for a long mm -hmm. time, completed an FKT of the Colorado Trail uh, this past fall in nine days and change. And in talking to Jeff, 
the the most notable thing, and this is almost universal with with all these guys, is the awareness that your body is breaking down slowly and not able to recover towards the end of the attempt. And often this is what hijacks an FKT attempt and and causes people to drop out. Jeff was able to overcome that, didn't didn't degrade too badly, but he was a mess at the end. So yeah. what what can we do in training to stave off this this bodily decay or is it just an inevitable thing that you just got to roll with? I'd love to know what his previous attempts were on other trails. I, I, I this isn't a, a, a one and done type thing. You know, you have to build up your experience yeah. level. And I think just the event itself, I, it's so funny. I, sometimes in my own, I mean, yeah, my adventures only last up to seven hours, but it's funny when I finish that a week later, I'm ready to do it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I have my best fitness ever seven days later. And I, it reminds me, I, I did an Ironman once and a, a, two weeks later, there was a local bike race, you know, a shorter event than Ironman. And I'm like, ah, I'll just go jump in it. I, and I won the darn thing. It was like oh, this, nice. this like, you know, rebound effect. Um, so my point is it's very, you can't replicate it in training. So you have to get out there and have some, you know, in cycling, we think, think a races b races and c races mm -hmm. and c races doesn't matter what your result is you don't change anything leading into it you are going to train through it it's part of part of training but the reason you do the c race is to gain that experience right right so can you do an event or an adventure you're not going to taper for it you're going to push through it's a fourth the distance of your big you know a race or your A adventure, um, you know, you might then have a B adventure, you know, your B race. And now you're really not going to manipulate training except have a little taper coming into right. it. So you're more fresh. Okay. What did I learn from my C adventure, my B adventure? Do I need more B adventures? Am I ready? You know, can I make that step up to the A, my A priority event? Um, so I think a lot of times the events, are the the most important training um workouts of, of all because you can't replicate it right in training so the mental side of it is such a big part of it to build up that confidence level um and and then physically to see where when and where and how do you break down then step take a step back and, and decide how can I then improve that limiter of mine, right. you know? So I'm not an expert in that, but I have to imagine it comes down to just experience level and building up those adventures over time so that you are better prepared for the main event. Yeah, for sure. And I think there's so much unknowns that happens when your body decays and you become sleep deprived. And being able yeah. to have been in that situation before and knowing how your body's going to react and your mind is, is going to react is a huge data point in being able to push forward. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not an expert at all, but I, I, I'd say it's, it's a, a buildup over time of, of experience. Yeah, for sure. All right. Let's transition into technology. So Dirk, you are huh. the founder of Training Peaks. It is software that's used to optimize endurance training regimens. Can you tell us a little bit about what the software does, what it does, what it's optimized for, and how we might be able to use it as backpackers? Yeah, Training Peaks really helps you manage, you know, tracking, analyzing, and planning, you know, all aspects of your training. And really, I'd, I'd say our number one value we bring is connecting athletes with experts. You know, we, we believe in setting goals and getting expert instruction. Um, not doing it on your own, getting a coach, getting a training plan. You know, we talked about you and I shared one of the, you know, the same coach, Scott Johnston, um, you know, having an expert to help you along the way is, is an immensely valuable. And that's what training peaks, um, really does is we help people get better at the things they love to do through expert instruction. So, um, you know, the software is in the middle, uh, you might buy a training plan. 
or hire a coach and all the content, all the programming is there on your calendar and you get the daily email of workout reminder the night before of what tomorrow's workout is. You go do it. You and you, hopefully you track it. You know, you yeah. have your Garmin, your Sunto, Polar, whatever it might be, GPS device, or it might just be the app in your pocket, hit start, stop. Um, but track what you do. If you don't track it, it's hard to improve it. Um, we don't need you to overanalyze it. You know, hopefully if you're working with a coach, that's what they are hired to do. Um, but by tracking it, then you can analyze it. And again, we don't need to overanalyze, but there are general trends you want to see. You know, I, ideally, hopefully you see volume increase or as we stated, pace at the same heart rate, you know, should increase your RPE, rate of perceived exertion of the same workout should improve prove over time. It should feel easier to do that same workout over time. And if you have it recorded, you can go back and relive those moments, or you can pull the chart that shows you your increase in volume week over week. We have recovery weeks as well. Um, so I think training peaks really helps you look at your training kind of holistically. We don't, we don't focus in on uh, beating people, you know, we're not Strava. You can use Strava to try and go as fast as you can and beat your buddy up whatever climb that that's where they live. Um, but we are about recovery workouts are just as, or more important than the hard workout, right. you know, in training peaks. So we're about setting a goal and preparing for it, you know, and helping you decide what to do tomorrow. So we have certain charts and, 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 um, reports that help you track that over time. And, and unique met metrics um, that help you dig in. And you can overanalyze if you want mm -hmm. in Training Peaks. Um, another aspect of Training Peaks is just being compatible with whatever device you use. I know you discussed Whoop in the past. Um, we're compatible with Whoop. And if you want to track HRV and sleep hours and deep sleep hours, et cetera, you know, the Whoop will directly sync to Training Peaks in your daily metrics. So you don't have to manually type that in to Training Peaks. And you can see how HRV then compares with your training load. Um, is it, you know, getting worse as you get more and more um, fatigued? Um, you know, and we're compatible with obviously Garmin and all the devices out there. So you can look at the map and graph and pace and et cetera. I think it's a fascinating platform. I've been a Training Peaks user for about six or seven years now. And um, since I started using it, the, the biggest thing I have learned is the need to recover. And I never really appreciated mm. this before, but um, watching the charts, um, you know, you've got, you've got this acute training load, a chronic training load and, and training their, stress balance and training stress balance and right. being able to see where you are on that, on that uh, stress balance score. And then, project out into the future. Okay. I want to make sure this is in sync with what I need to do before I start my event. Just mind blowing to me really has yeah. improved my performance. Yeah. And I always say, once you enter, you know, collect the data, you may not know anything at all, but just collect the data, get your Garmin, Sunto, whatever it is syncing. So you have the files, but when you enter your, your, your 13th month, your second year on training peaks, yeah. That's when the data becomes infinitely more powerful. That's because you can then go back over the last year and see, okay, well, where did I go? Really, where was I really strong? Where did I get injured? Where did I get sick? Where yeah. did I feel horrible? And highlight those and, and print it out. You know, highlight it with a marker. You know, on a piece of paper, and then see, well, how did all these um, metrics line up? You know, and especially training stress balance. You know, if you enter an adventure or a race in a fatigued state. Um, somebody who is less fit than you can easily beat you. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's what I always say. Right. You know, if your fatigue is higher than theirs, it doesn't matter how fit you are, you can get beat, you know, or you're not gonna hit your time that you're that you're going after yourself. So yeah, you can look at those trends over history to try and manipulate the future to replicate the times you went well. Um, so yeah, that's one of the aspects of training peaks. We try and educate people on, and we intuitively do this. We all do this. We know we should not do a really big six hour mountain hike starting the day before 
my FKT, right? right, right, You want to enter your FKT in a positive, fresh state. Now there, if you get too fresh, too positive, it's called detraining, right? So there's a balance. You don't want to come into a race. You, you have to lose fitness to go fast. That's part of getting fresh, but you can overdo it, of course. Yeah. Um, but seeing how all that lines up um, is really, really exciting. And we all intuitively do that. We just haven't always kind of put it to numbers. In addition, you've mentioned WHOOP and heart rate variability. We've got training peaks and heart rate monitoring so we can monitor load. Are there any other technologies and tools that you find interesting in today's training environment? Mm. Well, I mentioned the core body temp yeah. um, device. That's, I haven't personally used it, but definitely I know people that are well-respected that are using it. Um, that's another trend that we have a lot, not a trend, but it's an aspect of training that we have a lot to learn from, um, how to manipulate core body temp for positive results. We've always tried to stay away from getting hot, um, but there can be benefits to getting warm as well. So that's one kind of exciting new device I think is worth looking into. Um, HRV, certainly, you know, I mean, I think for me, I wore whoop only when I slept. Um, I felt like when I wore it for, didn't really give me a whole lot for training. Um, I couldn't analyze my heart rate in it. Right. Um, it was more about, okay, well, is my sleep routine hygiene dialed? How can I improve it? If, and I, I'll also try and check just my gut feel. If I wake up in the morning and I think I felt awesome, you know, did the whoop say I felt awesome? You know, and that gives me more confidence if, right. if it did. Um, yeah, for me, whoop really helped me kind of analyze my sleep hygiene and am I getting a quality sleep and how can I manipulate aspects um, of my sleep? And, and um, so, yeah, it, again, it just, I, I used it for helping me get better sleep and not really per se to analyze my, my daily training. And do you use it for HRV monitoring? Yeah, that was an aspect of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm horribly low though. So it, unfortunately I got depressed. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm at like 17 to oh, wow. 25. I mean, yeah. I, that's I'm your baseline. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm like 22, you know, like baseline, but I'd get down to 17 and a high might be 34. So I'm like, yeah. I'm like, um, I know it's, it's all individual, but geez, is something <laughs> wrong with me? You know? So I really, it got depressed too. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that. Um, we talked a little bit about heat as a way to hack endurance training. Are there any other strategies you think that are on the horizon that you, you see as being useful? Well, carb manipulation is certainly yeah. something that's happening these days. I'd be careful about fully fasted, although I did do it. Um, I, I think it did have detrimental effects the next day, sometimes two days yeah. later. Um, but it, I, it definitely helped. I think more carb manipulation is what I would um, consider now. Um, so yeah, those, those, I mean, there's not a whole lot of ways to, to, to hack fitness, <laughs> um, right. but there are, are ways that you can make improvements again, like blood plasma volume is a big one. And we know lots of stories about, you know, people taking drugs just to increase EPO and blood plasma. Right. But we can do this naturally too. So, um, that's worth looking into, you know, in heat training. But again, there's not a whole lot out there right now. I'd be yeah. cautious and just take it, take it a uh, grain of salt and note it's in its early. I mean, the, the science is kind of out there, but the protocols to put in place. Yeah, for sure. As we close, can you, can you offer some advice to our listeners who, who are doing a summer backpacking trip in July or August this year? They're heading to the Sierras or Colorado. So they're, they're doing their week long annual backpack at high altitudes and they've got four to six hours a week to train. How would you tell them to spend your time? Yeah. Um, I would, I always say like getting expert instruction 
everybody deserves. And the kind of lower level you are, the more impact it can have. Mm -hmm. You know, how how many of those hours do you want to waste? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and so you deserve it. You know, I would at least do an hour long consultation with a qualified coach, mm -hmm. you know, I or, you know, hire a coach, you know, you could get a training plan from someone. So the number one thing I would say is seek out expert instruction. I'm not a backpacking coach. Um, I used to coach cyclists and I was a pro cyclist myself and I train for ski mountaineering now. Um, but I would say consistency is key. Modulation is key. Don't overdo it because of those two. The, yeah. the consistency is so key. Yeah. So I know myself will overdo it and I'll tweak my back and oh my Lord, I can't do anything for the next three days. And when I start back up, it's very light. So I have to, as I get older and I'm over 50 now, you know, I definitely have to remind myself because I, I do that a couple times a year and overdo it and get injured and it just messes up my program. Um, so that, yeah, it's better to under train than over train. Yep. I concur. I, I turned 51 <laughs> this year and I'm suffering through a, a hyperextended toe injury now. <laughs> <laughs> the toe. So, and, and it is, you get panic because you have an event coming up and, and you tend to want your, I mean, you're, you're instinctively want to do more volume, but we all know that, that we all know better than that. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've learned, I can, I, I need to like state, okay, this Sunday is my big day. I'm going to do 10,000 vert this Sunday okay, I need to prepare for this Sunday and not go into it overcooked and yeah. be careful in that strength workout. And, you know, it's like, it used to just be, you know, clockwork. Now it's like, okay, I, I got to like, okay, be prepared for Sunday, you right. know? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, there's key workouts that, that you want to try and target and come into those, you know, ready to go. But then right. don't overdo it when you're in that workout either. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> That's where these tools can really be valuable to me, like Training Peaks. Um, final question: Where do you see Training Peaks going in the future? Like, what's your dream platform look like five years from now? Oh, that's been in my head for the last five years. It's always <laughs> in my head. Uh, that's the problem with software: you're always yep. five years out in your head. Um, you know, we're gonna be. We're definitely working on more. You know don't take this in the wrong way, but we're never going to replace the coach. We want to work right. with the coach and make them more effective, more efficient, smarter. Computers can do that. Yeah. Computers can work in the background and do a lot of calculations and a lot more kind of thinking, if you will, on behalf of the coach and surface to the coach, something they may not have known of, yeah. make them aware of something. So we definitely are working on those type of things. Um, even we, you know, um, auto scheduling for athletes, but yet it's the coach's individual methodology that will be prescribing those workouts. Yeah, you bet. Um, but it will be taking into account what the athlete did, how well did they perform in today's workout? And oh, by the way, they all of a sudden can't train tomorrow. You know, athlete available. Actually, we released today athlete availability in Training Peaks went live today as part of this whole concept. Um, and so, you know, these type of automated programming, um, um, I guess, um, features are going to be in the coach's methodology, their, their terminology, but it's going to make them more efficient and bring to light something they may not have known otherwise. So I, I, I really hope the computer can make the, the coach smarter and in the end help the athlete become better and more efficient and faster. So we're working on that right now um our first app actually that released um with this technology is called run with hal it, there's hal higdon is a well-known mm -hmm. running coach so we produce that app it's an it's a um it, it adapts to the athlete's lifestyle it sees what they did today and changes tomorrow's workout but it's all based on hal's theory thought methodology and workouts so we'll be coming out with more apps like that and eventually that will make its way into training peaks so that coaches can work with more athletes. Very cool. I like it. 
All right, Dirk, thank you very much. Um, I am sure our listeners will find this um, episode valuable on a number of fronts. And and I appreciate your time and uh, just wanted to let you know that we'll put information in the show notes about Training Peaks and about you and your your background and history and um, links to resources that we talked about in this episode. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. You know, you never know who you're, who you can benefit out there. And I love these conversations and helping athletes and it, it doesn't have to be a race and all That's kinds right. of adventures, you know, to help you get faster in your adventure. So we just we want, get... we just want people to enjoy their wilderness adventures more. Absolutely. That's what I live for. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Dirk. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Ryan, that was a great conversation, and I had two main takeaways. One, um, Dirk mentioned training the gut, and that is a concept that I've been exploring a lot lately in my attempts to turn myself into an ultra runner um, by by hook or by crook. And uh, that's what I learned after my f- my first big run was that I should have been training to eat the way that I was going to eat during my run. Yeah. And uh, I, that had never occurred to me before. And I don't know where I found that concept, I, maybe on an article in uh, Trail Runner magazine or something. But that, so I, it was gratifying to hear him say that because that makes me feel like I'm on the right track. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that he mentioned listening to his body. And I, I think that's an interesting concept from someone who created a software to help you analyze the stats that are coming from a machine, you know, on your wrist or something. And, um, I I think it just goes to show that, that what you're looking for is a blend between what the data says and how you feel. Um, but the struggle for me, I think I mentioned this before, I came to athleticism fairly late in my life. I didn't grow up doing varsity sports. I, you know, I was in my mid to late twenties before I really started to undertake big physical tasks. So I don't trust, I don't trust how I feel, uh, when it comes to recovery, when it comes to how hard to push, because I don't really know what I'm trying to, to measure. So when people say, trust your body, listen to your body, I, I'm always a little frustrated by that because I feel like the people who are saying that are professional athletes who are really in tune with their body. Right. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. I struggle with it too, but I struggle with the exact opposite. So I'm, I'm very in tune with my body and I, I know when I'm not doing well, but I, I check that against the data and I look at the data and I say, but the data says this. <laughs> <laughs> so while I trust my body, I don't always follow it. And so I, I found that to be very enlightening as well. And it, it highlighted the importance of for me, a practice, a meditative practice in the morning to really kind of do a body scan so that Mm. you can see what's going on. And I love doing that now, especially after a hard workout day, the previous day and, and training yourself to coordinate those two things, monitoring your data and listening to your body and understanding what's going on with it, I think is a really powerful combination. I'm not going to pretend to have mastered it yet. Mm Mm-hmm. I've heard a trainer friend of mine say that with recovery, it's how you feel, not what you've done. Yeah. And with, with training, it's what you're doing, not how you feel. Yeah. Does that seem seem like like an okay rule of thumb? Yeah. That seems great. Especially with recovery, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and waking up in the morning after a hard day. And I, if I do a hard workout and then I wake up one morning, I may do that same workout the next week. So I'm not changing my fitness dramatically week to week. And I have a totally different experience. It might be related to my sleep. It might be related to the type of food I ate after my workout. It might be related to the amount of stress in my life. So training is such a coordinated effort between all these emotional, mental, and physical systems that we, we seriously need to integrate them all into our understanding of body health. Well, is there anything else that stuck out to you specifically about the conversation? Yeah. Over the last few years, when I've trained in hot weather, I've always found that my stress 
was higher for a given amount of output. And I always thought, oh, this is not good. I, I should not be training in the heat because it's, it's causing additional stress on my body that I don't want. So my response has been, I'm going to the mountains where it's colder. Listening to Dirk, and then after, after getting off the conversation with him and going and looking at scientific research on this, training in the heat is a really powerful hack that can improve your endurance. I did not know that. That was a brand new thing for me. And so now I just want to go to the desert and train mm -hmm. all the spring. And, and uh, so that, that kind of enlightened me that, okay, here's a way I can, I can hack my system, do some indoor training even, turn the fans off, turn the heat up a little bit, and, and be able to get a really good workout in for maybe a little bit less time that I normally would get on a cold, windy day outside. Yeah, I, I went through a phase of listening to all the, uh, the biohacking podcasts a few years ago, and it seemed like the heat training and even, even something as minimal as hitting the sauna after a workout yeah. That seemed like the most scientifically supported of all of that kind of biohacking, quote unquote, type of uh, activities. Yep, for sure. I agree. All right. Well, let's close out the podcast just by talking about uh, what's new at Backpacking Light, maybe something going on in the forums. What's stuck out to you lately? We are, as you know, we're in this massive web development project and we're nearing the end of the development phase, which is the big one. And so we'll be done developing probably by the end of April and then we'll enter a quality assurance, quality control and testing phase. And that will be the subject of May. And so hopefully we can bang that out in two or three weeks and fix any bugs we have. And then um, I think in early May, we'll be opening it up, it up to some beta testers, which have already volunteered and, and we'll be bringing those guys online. And then, um, I'm shooting for a launch by the end of May, and then we should be rocking and rolling with a brand new, way more functional and uh, much, much easier to use website where it's easier to find and browse stuff. Mm -hmm. It looks so good. I'm as a visual person, I'm just excited about the, the visual, uh, improvements. Yeah, me too. Just the, simplifying the aesthetic is really important to me so that people know where they are at any given time and know where to go to find stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you? What's in the forums lately for you? You know, what I've learned since I've started working at Backpacking Light is that I have no idea what's going to catch people's interest in terms of what we publish. <laughs> I just, right. I can't get a handle on it. And, um, so we just published a piece by Rex Sanders last week, I think, and it's kind of um, just a lighthearted little. He sort of walks down memory lane a little bit and talks about all the gear he's used, at, you know, through the '60s and '70s. Not '60s. He would hate me for that. '70s and <laughs> '80s and uh, '90s and and so on. And I think that right now it has like in the '60s in terms of form comments on it, which I just was not expecting. Um, and it's been fun just to scroll through it and see like how the backpacking gear has progressed, what gear people wish had stuck around, you know, it's maybe not the lightest, or, but it's durable. And some people are talking about stuff they've used for 30 years, packs they've used for 30 years that they just won't get rid of. And it seemed like the, the article gave people a, a safe space, so to speak to to talk about like gear that's not the sexiest or the lightest or the coolest but that they just really love and i think that's it was a cool. very engaging instagram post as well when we promoted the article and i i didn't catch this because i was in a hurry but when we when we scheduled this in, instagram post the caption i left was the title of rex's article which mm -hmm. was you know you've been backpacking a long time when dot 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 and i just left that on the instagram post and then people took that as a prompt and then replied <laughs> <laughs> and there's tons of comments on there. And it was really interesting to me too. So what was the, what's the earliest experience you have with backpacking gear? So I started backpacking in my like 12 or 13 with my dad and my dad was using the gear that he'd grown up backpacking with. So a lot of this same stuff, like, uh, tents that, that have external, pole systems that the tent yep. clips into. Yep. Um, we were using uh, blow up pool pads as as um, sleeping pads in the winter 
you yep. know, zero insulation. Right. They would deflate halfway through <laughs> in the night. Uh, we were using, um, you know, those plastic containers that like sheets and comforters come in that yeah, sort of right. unzip. We were using those as stuff sacks because they were waterproof. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, basically whatever my dad could could get a, a handle on and a hold on and uh, a lot of made up stuff that was three times heavier than it should be. Right. My first backpack is this was the late 1970s was a aluminum frame Jan sport with mm -hmm. a 200 denier pack cloth nylon pack cloth bag, not waterproof or anything like that. And I, I used blue and slight foam, which was fairly new on the market at the time. So this was very exciting, but again, we'd use this in all seasons and, um, a very heavy sleeping bag. I think my sleeping bag was in the four to five pound range mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And then the rest was just whatever you could afford, right. which was not a lot of sophistication. And the, the most notable thing was my first shelter, which was basically a blue tarp from Walmart or, you know, it wasn't from Walmart then it was from the hardware store, but you know, the, the blue, you know, crap. Right. They've got the, tarp. they've got the grommets in them. And yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and I used that shelter all the way through my teen years until I was able to afford a, I think a bivy sack was my first actual mm -hmm. purchase, a Moonstone mountaineering bivy sack. Yeah. So yeah, it was a good, it was a good stroll down memory lane. Yeah. I'm thinking about, as you say that, I'm thinking about, I started backpacking in the Smokies in like this horribly scratchy green and black checked wool. Sweater, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, right. thick sweater and, and, you know, got rid of that as soon as I could went to other stuff. And right now I'm wearing a fairly scratchy <laughs> alpaca wool sweater that I have been testing all year round. So it's just interesting how things go in circles. That's pretty funny. I, I, I started out wearing rag wool socks, but I will never go back to rag wool. Oh, socks. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, we're going to wrap up the episode. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the backpacking light podcast. The Backpacking Light podcast is advertising free thanks to the membership fees paid for by Backpacking Light members. A BackpackingLight.com membership gives you access to 20 years of archives, forums, and online courses. So please consider supporting this podcast and become a member right now at BackpackingLight.com slash subscribe. You can download the show notes for this episode at BackpackingLight.com slash podcast. And if, if you enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we can leave you with one parting message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails, everybody. So I shoulder my backpack, walk away from the car.